Hello and welcome to a Parallel Project Training podcast. These podcasts are being recorded for the APM PMQ syllabus for exams starting in September 2024. My name is Ruth Phillips and I'm here with Lisa Regan, who is one of Parallel's senior trainers. Today we're going to be talking about solutions development. Welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Hi, Ruth. Looking forward to talking this one through. Yeah, absolutely. As with all of the podcasts, we've been using the PMQ syllabus as our guide. So APM says that we need to understand solutions development as the ability to determine the optimal solution to satisfy agreed requirements. We've got another podcast about requirements management. So might yeah. be a good idea for people to listen to that in conjunction with this. We've actually just got the one learning objective around solutions development. It's quite a small self-contained topic within the syllabus. APM asks us to know how to evaluate and prioritise requirements in order to deliver the optimal solution. So what do we have to do on our project here, Lisa? So options, appraisals, because really that's what we're talking about, is yeah. different options. We're talking about the business case to start with. That's right. where we're looking at these options. And we mustn't forget that vital one, the do nothing option. What would happen to your organisation if this project just didn't happen? What are the implications for that? Sometimes that's forgotten. The do nothing option can provide quite a compelling reason for why you've got to do something and why you've got to come up with a solution. If there's been legislative change, regulatory change, or maybe an IT system that's not going to be supported any longer, actually do nothing is like we used to call the burning platform. You've, you've got to that's jump, right. you've got to do something. That's right. I was reflecting on this earlier, Ruth, about options appraisal. And I thought to myself, in my project management career, I haven't really done a lot of this. And that's not a good thing. I thought, why? Because it's done in the concept phase. And a lot of projects that I've been on, you basically turn up and you're told, this is a project and off you go. Yeah, These are the resources. This is this. This is that. I think that's a really interesting observation because the, the problem that we've got is if we've got really different solutions to meet the requirements they're almost like different projects aren't they yeah. they'd have a different plan they'd have a different yeah. budget they'd have different benefits and so often there is some kind of feasibility that's done that conceptualization is done yeah. and that's got to be worked out before we can take the chosen solution forward to deliver our project that's right so the kind of things we should be thinking about if we're involved in this number one what are the acceptance criteria on your project so yeah. Is time the absolute key? Then that will constrain your options. If cost is the absolute constraint, that's going to constrain your options. So fundamentally, think about what are those things you're going to be measured on at the end of the project. But take into account things like what are your users' priorities because they've all got their own Absolutely. ways and means of looking at things. Even as fundamental as what life cycle approach are you going to go for? That will make your options sometimes quite limited. If you're working on more linear life cycle, you don't have so much opportunity to explore, evolve that That's solution right. as maybe you would with an iterative life cycle. In, in fact, just kind of side swiping into the differences, linear life cycle, we're doing this in the concept phase. Iterative, it's right across the life cycle. It's built in, isn't it? It's part of the woodwork. It's much more open to that way of thinking and that way of working. Don't be swayed if your stakeholders have got a favourite option because it might not be the right one. Sometimes we talk about pet projects as if this is a conscious decision. I think sometimes it's unconscious. People like solutionising and they like coming up with an answer for something. But yeah. it's very important for us actually to be quite disciplined and to do that exploration of different options because you never quite know what, what ideas might come up. That's it's a bit of a problem-solving activity really, isn't it? It's a little bit, a bit of a brainstorming situation. Yeah. So it talks about prioritising requirements yep. there yep. To, to deliver that solution. Is there a particular technique that you'd recommend that we use to do that prioritisation? Yeah, the one that always comes to mind is the Moscow okay. technique. Yeah, so the must have, should have, could have, won't have. And for me, right. that won't have is a really important one. I mean, we usually talk about Moscow in scope, yeah. but you could use that to prioritise your options, couldn't you? It must have this, it should have that, it could have that, and it definitely hasn't got to have that. So Moscow is the way of prioritising. But other things you could do to help you prioritise, what about doing an investment appraisal on the different options? Yeah. yeah. 
that would give you the cold hard facts. It takes all the emotion out of it in that way. Whether a stakeholder prefers an, an option or not, this is more financially viable than this one. It's giving you that direct comparison. It's really important to involve the stakeholders, think about those requirements, be really open to different options when we're doing this. Yeah. Um, other things about priorities, think about fundamental things. A simple example is, have you come up with, oh, we want to use this real cutting edge material. Can the market actually supply it in the volumes that you need? Yeah. It sounds like a bit of a no-brainer, but sometimes the supply chain's not big for the volumes that you might need. One of the, the methods that I really like, my background is in Japanese manufacturing, the five whys. It yeah. comes from lean manufacturing and mm. Japanese way of working. Just keep asking, why Why is that your preferred option? Yes. But why? But why? But why? Until you get to the real reason. You can quite often tease out those subconscious assumptions, things that aren't being voiced either deliberately or yeah. just because it's part of somebody's assumptions, mindset, ethos yeah. about how they're approaching something. So Absolutely. I think that's really useful. It could yeah. be the, we've always done it like this, yeah. try to dig to the bottom. Particularly if this is being really driven by the user's requirements, you're almost being constrained by the limits of their technical knowledge. That's right. There's a wide world yeah. with the new materials and new techniques that they might never have heard of. We touched on this in the discussion. The second mm -hmm. part of that first learning outcome then is to understand different approaches for different life cycle models. Yeah. We talked about the, the need within the linear life cycle to make this decision about what the optimal solution is up yeah. front, because otherwise we're not going to be able to plan those linear phases. But with an iterative approach, it will be much more of an involving solution. Yeah. So yeah. it talks here about the use of MVP and MMP in iterative life cycles. What's that mean? MVP stands for minimum viable product. The first time I heard people using this term, probably about 10 years ago, I thought to myself, well, I don't want to produce a minimum viable product. That's not good enough. It's got a negative connotation somehow, hasn't it? But when I read into it, minimum viable product, it's the first version that's got enough features for you to gather some feedback. Right. That's the real key for me. Yeah. It's not just the minimum viable. It's the minimum viable to enable you to take it out to people and say, what do you think? If you just give someone an idea and say, oh, we're thinking of doing this, they will go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. But when they actually see it and they actually have to click yeah. so many buttons to get to what they need to, yeah. you could get a completely different yeah. set of feedback. Absolutely. So it's all about learning the, the quickest, the, the minimum we have to do to be able to gather that feedback. And that early feedback, it's a chance for you to change. You can yeah. say... Actually, that's not working. What can we do to make that better? There's a great phrase in iterative uh, and agile projects of fail fast. Yes, and, and I think that yeah. that's really key. Yeah. That actually, the further along your life cycle you get, the further into your project you get, the more yeah. costly it is absolutely. to change or to deliver something yeah. that's not working. But if you yeah. deliver the MVP and you get a lot of negative feedback on it, okay, You've failed, but you failed quickly. You can do something about it quickly without it. really impacting costs and benefits. That's it. And, and for me, you're managing the risk by doing that. Absolutely. That won't necessarily be applicable on all types of projects, but where we can, it's a really useful concept to think about. Yeah. The The next one that people talk about is this one, the MMP. Yeah. Yeah. The minimum marketable product. Multiple iterations of an MVP will give you an MMP. The more you take it out and test it and, and refine it and make it better, make it more fit for purpose, Yeah, you will end up with something that you are happy enough to show it to the world, right? not just to show it to a select group of people. That so makes sense. The MMP yeah. is, is it marketable? Not yeah. just, is it usable? But would yeah. you be proud to open the doors and say, this is the next big thing? I guess there's that commercial aspect involved. Is it good yeah. enough that people would pay money for this? Yeah. Can it be yeah, monetized and marketed? Yeah. yeah. You've made me think there of the development of Facebook. Okay. Because remember, in the, its very early stages, Facebook was just used by Mark Zuckerberg and his friends in his college as an, an internal product. And I guess yeah. that was then... First of all, developing an MVP, getting yeah. something that actually worked and, and gathering loads of feedback about what features people wanted. And yeah. then the moment that this was publicly available, it became the MMP. And, that's what it, and it had the look, didn't it? It had yeah. the, the brand of Facebook. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yet it continues to evolve. Yeah. There are still features being yeah. added, released as we go on. That's really interesting. Fantastic. Well, short but sweet. That is solutions development. Developing that optimal solution 
by evaluating and prioritizing requirements. And then we've talked about different approaches in different life cycles, focusing on the iterative life cycle and the use of this concept of the MVP and the MMP on an iterative project. Excellent. Thank you very much for your insight on that, Lisa. That's been really interesting. No problem. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks. Bye.